Uh, so, Anas, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Well, this is our newly launched Dubai Wave podcast, mm -hmm. and our vision is to do interviews with people that are making it happen in Dubai in various industries, various verticals. And to date, we've had some very interesting people from MMA and food and the magazine industry. And we are thrilled to have you here. And the topic is entrepreneurship. And so to get started, why don't you tell us a bit about uh, your background and uh, how you got into the field of entrepreneurship? Um, well, my background has really nothing to do with that, what I do now. Um, I studied mechanical engineering. Uh, because I come from, I think it's a very typical Arab, Asian thing where your families think you should be a lawyer, doctor, or engineer. Traditional. Traditionally. And anything else doesn't count. So uh, I got a scholarship to, to go to Boston mm. uh, to study engineering. So it started with chemical engineering, which obviously didn't last too long, and then switched to mechanical uh, for four and a half years. But uh, my dilemma was that I loved football all my life. Um, he can relate for sure. Yeah, and um, I've had, a, that's my very obvious passion. I think everybody usually has an obvious passion sometimes. It's very clear what we like, but not necessarily it translates to, to a career. And uh, we were brought up to think that there's no future in football. There was no professionalism in the, in the country. Mm. Uh, the league was not professional, uh, so I'm at my time, I'm, I'm born in 81. Um, so yeah, I, I honestly thought that it, is, it will remain in the box in my brain that is labeled a hobby. So I played varsity, I played semi-pro in the US, I played for the state team, but always with the mindset that once I graduate it's just, uh, just a hobby. Um, but the last year, I think all of my entrepreneurship journey came organically, I would say. The last year we had a, a football game against the Saudi guys. Mm -hmm. So it was UAE versus Saudi. The last year of college last in year Boston. Of college. Yeah. At Northeastern University. At Northeastern, yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we assembled a, a so-called national team of the UAE <laughs> representing our country. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they told us we're going to this new field. And the interesting thing was that they told us you have to get your normal cleats, but it's indoors. So for me, that was very weird to hear because usually if it's indoors, you wear your flat shoes. Right. You don't wear yeah. cleats. And, and I was like, what do you mean you bring your cleats indoors? Then it's like it's this grass and mm. you just come. So I got both shoes just in case. And uh, we squished in a small, I think it was a golf cart or something, <laughs> like eight or nine guys. I don't know how we actually managed to squeeze, but we reached there, quite an abnormal shape, I think, and <laughs> twisted. <laughs> but yeah, we went in, and, and it was that, that moment that mm -hmm. you see something and you're like, Eureka, maybe mm -hmm. it's an idea that mm -hmm. I can bring to Dubai, because I see this beautiful field, mm -hmm. no potholes, no broken or damaged grass, and mm -hmm. it's artificial grass. It's the first time I see artificial grass in that manner, mm -hmm. which is long, and there's like, it's like sand, but it's not sand, it's rubber. Mm -hmm. And you can wear your cleats, but it's air-conditioned. So it's pretty cool, and I thought, you know what? In my country, this would be a hit. I always go back for vacations, and we just don't even find a nice, decent facility to play in. Um, so that was an, the first. An indoor soccer facility that has artificial turf, is what you're yeah. saying. I see. Interesting. Air-conditioned indoor, and that's as soon as I came back to Dubai after graduation, m my life split into two. It actually so helped with the, with the weather of Dubai, so it's air conditioning. Yeah, because that's what you think. You know that Dubai has this very challenging weather. Yeah. You yes. know, it's humid, it's hot most of the year, and, and a lot of people will use that as an excuse not to play their sport. And I thought, you know what, this will be good for the community. It's, it's what I love. I see. Awesome so idea. Nobody had thought of that before. We were the first, yeah. yeah. The first in the UAE to provide indoor air-conditioned uh, artificial grass fields. So, so this, this was your introduction to entrepreneurship. You saw this <clears throat> was happening in the U.S. and Boston, yeah. Northeastern, and then you decided to take the idea here. And so how did, that actually, how did you actually execute that when you came here? Um, I came here and mm -hmm. I had the parallel life. So mm -hmm. the typical corporate life mm -hmm. where I literally... Each two and a half, three years, I would change a job just because I know I don't like it. So I would, I was in an oil field, and then in the properties because everybody was in properties, as you see Dubai now right. is where it is. Uh, then philanthropy, which was one of the most rewarding jobs I've had. Then football, funnily, 
officially I was the chief of operations of the football league here. Mm. And then I quit all the corporate world. But in parallel, I was working on, on Ahdaf, which is the first uh, startup I had. I see. And we started with two football fields in 2009. And today we've reached 27 across oh. the UAE. Across. All over the UAE. Yeah. But these are all indoor. No, mixed. Oh, mixed. Okay. Yeah. So going before that, how can you talk about your early life in Dubai? How, which school did you go how to? How early? Like, uh, how since you were like... Okay. But you were born in the United States. Born in Dubai and straight away back to New York. Oh, so see. my father was studying architecture in mm -hmm. Syracuse, mm -hmm. New York. So as soon as I was born, we went back there. Yes. And I was there for four years. So that's a very early life. Yeah. And then grade school, high school, Dubai. And then uh, I was in Dubai National School. Okay. And then college back to Boston okay. yes so what did you want to study after graduating from school I honestly didn't want to study anything I didn't I had no interest I only knew that I loved football yeah. um, but I was I was good in grades so I got a scholarship and they said we give you the scholarship if you do engineering and I'm like okay good ticket to America why not it's, it's honestly as lame as it sounds <laughs> that I thought let's go to America and enjoy college life and I found a ticket that I can study in. And um, how did you enjoy Northeastern University? I loved the States. Yeah. I, I loved Boston. I thought Boston was a very balanced city. Yeah. Uh, it's not crazy, yeah. probably like Miami or Vegas, yeah. and then not as boring as other states. Yeah. It's in the middle, yeah. and it's a young city. Yeah. So very into multicultural. I really enjoyed my time there. And I think it really shaped a lot of my personality. Mm. And for me, I mean, you guys are in AUD, so you would know, and you, you have a good benchmark between America and here. Mm. Uh, personally, so I think you can tell that education probably anywhere in a developed world today is quite at the same level, mm -hmm. but it's everything around that. Sure. It's your life. It's point. how you manage your problems, your mm -hmm. challenges, and become independent. Right. And you know, we 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 ca we tend to live a very lead a very spoiled life. Mm -hmm. uh, in Dubai, it spoils a lot of people. Everything is convenient. It is, isn't it? So You're when right. you go abroad, yeah. you need to cook, you need to wash, you need to pay your bills, you need to. <laughs> Do yeah, the things that you're not used to doing, which is important, I think. Yeah, and excellent didn't point, you yeah. think about like uh, working in the engineering field at all? Or I tried, but I'm, I'm very true to myself. Um, there are two types of people in this world. They're the type that they'll always stay and they can end up being miserable, but they're still complaining about the same boss for years and years. And after two, three years, you're like, OK, I'm, I'm actually tired of hearing the same complaint. Are you going to either accept working where you're working with your annoying boss or you're going to actually move to a new place and I'm the other type the, the moment I know that I've given it a good shot and I'm not content or happy I'm yeah. out in anything you make you the kind of person that makes a move right yeah I can't uh, I have to move on and I, I couldn't agree more I think that's an, that's a very good point and well put and I, I agree that there are people who are just passively accept the situation complain about it but yeah. stay in that situation yes and it's a very healthy thing to <laughs> recognize a problem and move on. Or I think people are afraid to change yeah, in general. They don't like the unknown. They don't like not knowing what's the result. Mm. And that's why they tend to stay in their comfort zone, even though the comfort zone can be a very negative one. Um, but if you have that bit of calculated risk, let's say, not even a crazy risk, mm -hmm. you have to jump sometimes. And it's rewarding. Sometimes it's fa it fails, and sometimes, you know, you move on. And yeah. So let's, but perhaps, you were about to ask a question, I think. Yeah, I, I have a class, a lot of stuff. Sure. That so, so first of all, like, can you talk us more about Ahdaf? How did it start? Like, who, who, who inspired you to, like, you talked about inspiring from Boston to Ahdaf. Yeah, Adaf. the spark was in Boston, and the execution was here. And I have uh, three business partners yeah. with me, and uh, they've been great. I mean, because all of us had full-time jobs, and a lot of people are like, if, if none of you dedicate yourself to the business, it will fail. I think if I had done it alone, I would have. It wouldn't have worked because all of us had other jobs. But because we were four, and using four part-times, you can probably compensate to be one full-time. Mm. But I would still argue and say, you need somebody full-time. When you yeah. say four, you mean your brothers? Four, no, no. Okay. The first business is oh. with friends. Oh, okay. The okay. second business, I did with this my is brothers. The, you, you are, this you are the one who founded Bukash Brothers. Second business, yeah. Second business. And co-founded Ahdaf. But I was the first guy to, who started Ahdaf. 
and then my, my partners had the similar idea, so we said, you know what, yeah, let's just join for it. forces and, and do it together. And it was one of the best decisions. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what's the norms of Bukhash Brothers? Like how, how, what, I saw it, it's a celebrity <laughs> yeah, it's uh, a kind of thing. Yeah, celebrity and influencer marketing agency. And the first also. Uh, Finally, it's the first one again in the UAE uh, to be specialized in this field. Now everybody's doing it, of course. Influencer the, fir marketing. the first to be specialized in the field of influencer marketing. Yeah. Influence marketing. And when uh, did you found that company? Uh, October 2010. I see. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I see. October 2014. Yeah. My bad. But actually, I found it very cool. Like he goes out with the celebrities. He That's the football. cool part, yeah. He plays, <laughs> he plays football with uh, Del Piero. That's a, he just posted a picture on Instagram with Del Piero. I saw a picture of you with uh, Will Smith, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Was that part of this uh, project? No, or? that is one of our... So, Ahdaf is the football business. Yeah. And I explained how there were certain sparks. Yeah. Right. When it comes to Bukhash Brothers, it's also, again, organic. Right. And there were various sparks that led me to opening this agency. Mm. So one of them is what you just mentioned. When, when uh, my friend is Maxwell, the singer from the US. Not everybody would probably know, but in his field, a lot of people would know him. So when Maxwell came for the first time to Dubai, um, he's a good friend and we showed him around. And then by coincidence, Tyrese, the actor came. Okay. And he introduced us to Tyrese. And then he introduced us to Will Smith, who was also here on his first time to Dubai. Yeah. Now, I know Tyrese is a big fan. He's, uh, at least of Abu Dhabi, he talked about Everywhere. It. He, he Tyrese loves the Middle East, I think, or oh the yeah. Gulf in specific. Okay. He loves UAE and specific. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. big supporter of the, the country. And so he introduced you to Will Smith. Was Maxwell introduced me to Tyrese and to Will Smith. Oh, I see. Both. And then was there a business angle to that? I no, mean? and that's where it was interesting. A lot of people <coughs> started to call, especially Will Smith is on a different level mm. when it comes to celebrity. I mean, sure. even the guy cleaning the streets would know him. Yeah, right. And literally, the amount of calls we would get, oh, we want to work with him, or I'm like, listen, guys, I don't represent the guy in any work yeah. manner. Yeah. He's not my cousin. I don't <laughs> know him that well. Yeah. You know, I'm just being friendly and. And we're showing him the country yeah. and the culture. And he fell in love with the UAE. I mean, after that, I think he's been here maybe six or eight times. Hmm. But he hadn't been there previously? Because he's, no. he's been a celebrity for a long time. Yeah, but for, finally never to Dubai till, till that year. Okay. And uh, so we took him around Dubai. Then we went skydiving. My first skydiving experience. So it was a good first time. Mm. Giving, uh, <laughs> giving Will Smith the Dubai yeah. tour. So it was fun. <laughs> but cool. that was one of the sparks, let's say. I see. And for, then for, your, for, for the business, the influential yeah. marketing business. And then Maxwell, in his concert, uh, shouts out to us brothers, and he goes, the Bukhash brothers are here. Nice. So that picked, like, we, it, it, it stuck, I would say. That's and we're cool. like, you know, it's a cool name. We're three brothers. We, we launched, we, we work with all of this, so why not? Oh, I see. So the name came from when Maxwell screamed it out at a concert. Yeah, definitely supported it, for okay, sure. Okay, cool. So you have, you have three brothers? Or yeah, from three. my mother and father were three brothers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I know Harith only. Harith was AUD. Hey. Uh, Muad was AUD also. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, so two of your brothers. I'm the only one who escaped <laughs> to, <America>. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, the actual country. <laughs> Got it. Um, interesting. But it's, it's interesting because that was just one spark for Bukhaj Brothers. Another was, I, in my last job, especially with the, being the, the chief of the league, I would meet a lot of the footballers in mm -hmm. town in, in, my, in my country. So a lot of people were like, can you talk to Amori, who's mm. one popular footballer, or mm. can you talk to... And then also my social media influencer friends were also friends, so people would say, can you give us their number? Or, mm -hmm. And I would ask them, do you want me to give your number? Or, and then it became a point where I'm like, okay, this yeah. charity business needs to stop. <laughs> There's a gap. There's obviously a gap because... Because they keep coming to they you. They come to me to talk to them, and the celebrities and the influencers want me to represent them on that deal or negotiate or read the contract. And I'm so like, you know, yeah, it's all money. Yeah, exactly. And I like it, and I'm good yeah. at it. Yeah. So I said, you know what? Let's let's open an agency, a proper one. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. And what about the motivation speaking, or one of the TEDx motivation speakers? Yeah, that's uh, a passion I have, I guess. I've always liked uh, talking, I guess. Mm -hmm. I love to talk about things that I love. And uh, it came also, also, I would say, randomly. Uh, I think I'm good on stage. And uh, if I can reach the youth and even out of a lecture, one person, you know, gets affected in a good way and he wants to do uh, his own business, then great. And then mm -hmm. it's a success. So, yeah, I signed also a long-term deal with um, 
Abu Dhabi Economic Development uh, Organization, and we used to do tours across the UAE. I mean, literally, Liwa to Fujaira to Ras Al Khaimah to all universities, just mm -hmm. to talk to students. And I enjoy this. Have way. you spoken here at AUD? I probably have. I know AUS have done two or three. AUD maybe once, if I'm not mistaken. I see. Not sure. So you were you were also part of Abu Dhabi Sports in a football show. Yeah, I had my media stand that I forgot <laughs> to yeah. mention. Yeah. I was in uh, football. I started in, in, on TV in sports. Oh, so okay. it was Dubai 1. Uh, we had a, a program called World of Sports. And then I moved to Abu Dhabi Media, where I was this uh, analyst or commentator on English Premier League. Okay. And then I moved to interviewing celebrities and influencers on another show. And then we had a morning show also. So mm. yeah, I had some experience there. I see. Yeah. So I saw you graduated from UAE in 2003, right? Graduated from Boston 2003. 2003. Yeah. Then you started your entrepreneurship in 2010. Or no. yeah, the media. media uh, the work. media to 10, I think. Yeah. When, what, what happened with during this gap, six years? I was what learning you? from life. <laughs> I explore. I'm a guy who likes to explore. I like to try things, whether it's food or traveling. I'll try anything. I'll yeah. try a new experience just to say, yes, I like it or I don't. I yeah. don't like when people don't try. That's good. Uh, so I, t I think I grew up a lot in, in the years. And you went also to Bangladesh? And yes, that is with my job with Dubai Cares. So with Dubai Cares, they actually just celebrated their 10th year anniversary, which was really nice. Um, I joined them first on a voluntary uh, job to Bosnia. So I do photography also. Well, I stopped, but I enjoyed mm. photography for a long time. Uh, especially National Geographic type of photography, very mm. raw and real. Mm. So I joined, uh, so uh, Her Excellency Reem Al Hashmi said, why don't you join the team that's going to uh, Bosnia with Sheikh Maktoum bin Mohammed? So I said, you know what, yeah. I, and he, she, she's like, you can take a lot of pictures there. And so I did. And then after that, uh, they asked me to join them as an employee to mm. manage some countries' programs. So they focus on primary education for kids. And I was like, you know what, it's, it seems like a rewarding job. I always like a new experience. So I joined them as a country program manager. I had Yemen, Comoros Islands, uh, Mauritania, and Bangladesh. And I saw a very interesting part in this, in this part of your life where you said in your website that mm. you were inspired by your wife and photography. I used to be married. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah, and she was a very good, she is, she is a very good uh, photographer. So, uh, you know, the f I think before Dubai Cares, we, um, we went on, yeah, it was called the Dhaka Project. So we went on this voluntary also program to Bangladesh. This is before my Dubai Cares time. And yeah, I took photography there. And of course, she'd give me advice and, and whatnot. And it, it helped. She's very artistic. She's AUD grad also. Yeah. So, yeah. So Dubai Care, can you tell us a bit more about Dubai Cares? What's the initiative behind that? It's obviously it's a philanthropic organization, yeah. right? And what, what are they aiming to do then? So um, Dubai Cares was launched by Sheikh Mohammed mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Um, and it was with the aim to provide access to quality primary education for kids around the world. Okay. Because the belief is that's what actually sustains, that's what actually uh, removes poverty. I mean, I, I can I give you food, that, yeah. I can give you what not, but that's temporary relief. Right. So they wanted to focus on a better model. And then they partner with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, UNICEF, mm -hmm. Save the Children, mm -hmm. Right to Play. So it's a very interesting job, you know, completely different dimension for me. So in your role for Dubai Cares, you mentioned the places you went to, what you, you said, uh, Bangladesh, yeah. Yemen. I manage the programs in these countries. Okay. So yeah. What did you do precisely? I mean, you're bringing education, so how, yes. does, how does that work? So let's say um, in Bangladesh, we worked in rural <coughs> areas mm -hmm. that were really difficult to get to. Yeah. But it was making these huts mm -hmm. for kids that just don't have access to basic education. So okay. that was in Bangladesh. In yeah. other countries, like Mauritania, you'd see a holistic system where the parents are given jobs mm. to, to make money, and then that money is also used to uh, refurbish a school so suddenly even if you leave after five years they have a system in place that makes money and maintains so a lot of these programs the moment you leave yeah they're done it falls apart yeah you have to so create you, some you try to build the system yeah. excellent yeah so also the family is 
part of inspiring a lot of people. Like I saw that your mother just launched her second, second book. book. Yes. Can you talk us more about the book and what's like? Uh, my mother's now, she, we work, she's actually signed with Buchash Brothers also, obviously. She doesn't have a choice, I think. <laughs> um, so we work a lot on her uh, in terms of branding strategy and, and what she does. We're trying to take her to the next level also. And uh, she's quite a popular figure now when it comes to uh, women empowerment, women's well-being. Uh, she's a life coach and she takes them on these uh, hiking and trekking trips across the world. So they, they're now actually in Bali. Uh, goes to Italy, Japan, uh, and what she does is she does these, sh there's a big belief in, in hiking and trekking, mm -hmm. and while doing that you do workshops, you do lectures, and you talk about things, and if she can make women happier and more content, that means you make a society happier and more content, because you know, the woman is the most important or integral part of a household and of a society, um, and that is her mission, I mean, that's what she's trying to do, and her second book, her first book was probably more about who she is and what she's about. And her second book is more life lessons. She made it purposely very short and easy to read that you can literally jump into any chapter. You don't need to read the previous uh, chapter. So I'd like to receive some. And what are the uh, names of the books? Um, and the second one is called Hala and Life in English. Okay. And the first one, I don't remember the English name. Yeah. And, name? and your mother's name, just so people will know. Hala Kaza. Okay. 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 okay, I found it. <laughs> I'm Googling yeah. her as we speak. Okay. I found it. Cool. So you received also like one kind of award that we were actually fascinated by the name of the award, which is Best Dressed Man. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah, so you were awarded Best Dressed Man of, of which year? 2016. 2016. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> what's, your, uh, what's your relationship to clothes and fashion? Finally, my next business is actually a street fashion label. Oh, really? I'm launching it in the next few months. Um, I, I, I love fashion, I guess, because it's representative of who you are. Um, the way you dress is the way you carry yourself. And I do think Emiratis have a long way to <laughs> educate themselves <laughs> in fashion. Mm -hmm. And I think it's getting there. But like now, you see the guys are moving from the typical high-end brands that have a big logo on their T-shirts. Yeah. or 100 logos on one t-shirt <laughs> and now suddenly it's they're learning that that's not really only style you can be very subtle and, and stylish at the same time so I don't know I have a personal interest in, in fashion and quality and I thought uh, I've made I made this rule with myself I only do things that I love and that I'm good at mm -hmm. I have to mix these two so a lot of people love things but they're just not good at them right and you tell them and they're stubborn and they don't agree I see but I like to say and find, tell people, okay, what do you really love and what are you really good at also? It has to be the and That's combination, yeah. Too. yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. So, uh, so that's have, part three. As we have common interest in football, yeah. so what's your favorite team in UAE? Ars uh, <laughs> the in only UAE. team I follow is Arsenal, yeah, I which is depressing also. Your Anas yeah. Burkhash brother, uh, Anas Burkhash questions you post on social, uh, I social media. Yeah. Which is interesting, I see always the background with Arsenal t-shirt. Yeah, I that's, the, that's the when the team was great. Now it's... Uh, yeah. But my Boston team did well this year, the Patriots. Oh, yeah. I was, my so. father was a huge fan of uh, Brady. That was one of the greatest comebacks in NFL history. That uh, catch was unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I've seen something like that in a long time. Although I don't yeah. follow American football much, but I saw, of course, that, that highlights. Yeah. It was great. No, it was really, it was really good time for and American sports. Who is your favorite player in UAE? In the UAE? Amori. Yeah. I think he's the, on, he's the only talent. They call me Amuri. Of he, yeah, he, has the same <laughs> he has the same area. Oh, yeah? Amor. yeah. <laughs> so Amuri is a pure talent. I think he's one of the few footballers yani, that can uh, definitely go to Europe. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to take him to Amuri is also with us in the agency. So he's, you want, I was going to ask that. He's one of your clients. So yeah, for I sure. Gotcha. Yeah. And Terry Henry, of course. As Terry, well. yeah, as an international footballer, not only as a athlete but now also as a friend I think uh, he's a very he's a great guy very interesting guy and yeah I love how he played as an athlete how he approached the game I mean there are certain personalities you have to respect in sports whether it's Michael yeah. Jordan or Muhammad Ali or I mean the way they approached and the amount of work they put behind the screen mm -hmm. that was that's what you need to respect as much more than what you see on TV because it's it's out of something they worked hard to reach mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. so yeah. that's true Right. Yeah, I saw uh, there's a, a famous uh, Instagram or Twitter video of uh, of uh, 
LeBron James getting cryo cryogenically frozen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's another I've tried one. That, yeah. Have you tried that? Yeah. There's another one where he takes an ice bath. You know, but what's it like to get cryogenically frozen then? I did the one in Emirates Towers, yeah. Okay. I think it goes to like minus some crazy number. I forgot how much to reach. It's and super only cold. in an instant, right? Yeah. It's m but it's not uh, wet. It's okay. not water. Yeah. It's vapor. Yeah. So you don't like you don't need to get a towel or anything. But mm -hmm. and I know a lot of these athletes have it at home, mm. and you need to probably do it every day. It's not what, a what one-time thing. What is the benefit thing. then? Uh, recovery. Yeah, just it's great for recovery, recovery, for injuries, for recovery. Like if we went to the gym today, usually you're sore the next day. Right. If you use this, you're probably at least by 50% hmm. better, hmm. at least. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. The ice bath is the classic way. Yeah, right. When we were playing football, that's right. what we do right after right. the game. Right. You know? The cryogenic is the yeah. modern version. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Who else from the celebrities is part of the Bokesh brothers rather than Amuri or, or football players? Footballers a lot, uh, but one of our biggest projects was with uh, Selena Gomez, uh, Gigi Hadid, Kendall Jenner. We brought them all to Dubai. There was a big group of celebrities and, and uh, people in fashion that we brought to Dubai. And it was an interesting project. I mean, it was very good for Dubai as in terms of promotion. So yeah, that was one of our biggest ones. Who are the biggest celebrity fans of Dubai that you know? I mean, you mentioned already uh, I mean, Tyrese, Will Smith, yeah. Selena Gomez, is yeah. she a big fan? Who else? I yeah. think, honestly, I've hardly met somebody who hasn't liked Dubai. Yeah, I mean, you got to love Dubai. I guess what I'm asking is who, like, is a diehard fan, like, always here? You know? The footballers, for sure, because every break they get, you see them uh, coming back. Mm. Um, I don't know, really. I know a lot of them even have, they've stayed here or bought property mm, here. Yeah. I mean, Nicholas Anelka, you know, huh? mm. he has, a, he has a, his own place here. Uh, a lot of these uh, celebrities are actually getting, getting places here, so you know that they're definitely invested in, sure. in the place, yeah. Who are some of your more interesting clients? Can you speak to that? Or? I mean, to name clients? For, yeah. We've worked a lot with Dubai Tourism. Mm -hmm. We've worked a lot with Samsung. Um, Abu Dhabi now tourism also. We've been doing a lot of projects with them, and it's nice to work with them too. We've started working with luxury brands recently. Mm. I won't name them because they're probably sensitive <laughs> about this. <laughs> but yeah, usually we also display it in our social media if we work with somebody. Yeah. But yeah, these are some that we've been recurring. And of course, I don't want to forget the smaller businesses. Mm. You know, we've worked with smaller startups that we want to push and to help take to the next level. I can't forget where I'm from also. Mm -hmm. That's where I started, so mm -hmm. it's nice to have them. So back to photography, <laughs> you went all around, like we saw all around the yeah. map, you went to a lot of places. What was the best country of photography? Like Photography-wise, Bangladesh is the one of the most colorful countries I've seen. Hmm. Bangladesh. But one of the poorest and dirtiest I've been to. Yeah. Yeah, really Where, tough place. For photography, you're not talking about urban photography, are you in Bangladesh? No. You mean like going out into rural rural areas. Yeah. I see. And where else? Anywhere else that you particularly like in terms of photography? Photography? Um I didn't really do good photography this time. I didn't take any of my cameras, but one of the most beautiful countries I've recently been to is New Zealand, Queenstown. Okay. Mm. It was just gorgeous. And it's been a while since uh a place left an impression on me like that. I just thought it was I was at beautiful. the gym yesterday and I was watching uh, Lord of the Rings on they had playing. Okay. And I just remembered how beautiful the New Zealand landscapes are. Because if you watch Lord of the Rings, it's all in New Zealand. And you know, it's the, there's a tour. There's a Lord of yeah. the Rings tour. Yeah, right. Yeah. And Peter Jackson put that on the map as a location. Yes. Because I don't think people thought we're going to fly to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. But when you watch that movie, that's one of the reasons why it's so striking in terms of the landscapes, you're not used to seeing certain landscapes that you see in that movie, it's all in New Zealand. Yes, it's gorgeous, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everybody will tell you about the Switzerland and Austria, but for me, those are, are I don't know how to explain, but they're just too pretty and mm. too pristine that you feel it's a painting. Okay. New Zealand is more raw beauty, okay. it's just, I don't know, if you go there, you'll know what I mean. I know it from, look, from watching all the Lord, Lord of the, the Rings movies, but the way yeah. you describe it, that's actually how I envision it from yes. the movies. Yes. No <coughs> plans for going back to media or having... Or I like my social media. I have my freedom there. So okay. maybe YouTube, but uh, to go to a TV station, unlikely. 
And like, yeah, I'm did you have like a very bad? No, the experience was good, but it's not. I'm a guy who likes to be free and mm. to do things the way I want to do things, and I want to ask the questions that I feel I should be asking. I don't want to be constrained or restricted. So when you work in a big corporation, you have to be, you know, out of respect, out of guidelines, and I'd rather be an artist about it and do my YouTube or whatever in my mm -hmm. own manner. Mm -hmm. I think that's much better. So as we we all know that now we're going on the uh, the show the victorious show which is like yeah I'm going to a game tonight actually yeah yeah well, uh, can you tell us more about like what do you do in the victorious show or what the victorious show just to maybe tell mm -hmm. you it's like X Factor but for footballers okay. in the Arab world I see. so it's a very cool concept mm -hmm. um, and it gives these guys who may never made it a second chance so now we're season three uh, our role. Uh, in the Victorious is one is just overall consultancy because my friend owns the show mm. so he, he likes to use me as a consultant or an advisor in whatever capacity there and then the footballers so some of the footballers we will uh, secure for the show and bring them there and so who's the lineup of the of the year? Ah, it's a secret. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> You'll see it next month. But you're filming yeah. it tonight is that what you mean? We're filming tonight. Tonight Absolutely. they have a test match, football match. Okay, just to just so I understand, so the Victorious is what? It's a talent hunt of soccer yeah. players? Yes. Okay. And then you basically do it as a kind of reality TV show? Yes. Okay. So and literally like X Factor, you have the auditions yeah. where they go literally to Jordan, to Lebanon, mm -hmm. whatnot. Mm -hmm. UAE, Kuwait. Oh, I see. Do the this trials. is the UAE episode or something? No, or? it is it's a filmed, show though. based here. Oh, I see. So then all see. of the best of the best, okay. I think it's 20. Like 20 plus, they bring them to Dubai. Okay. And then they're trained mm -hmm. vigorously. Mm. And then they're tested against, now we're letting them play against uh, official clubs here and the reserve uh, league. Mm. So it's proper test. And then every week uh, there's a special guest, a typical international celebrity footballer that is one of the judges. Okay. And one, one of them has to get out. One has to get Oof, kicked out. That's yeah. harsh. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it gets harder and harder, of yeah. course. And is it in English or is it in Arabic? Or Arabic. In Arabic. Okay. Yeah, I th but I know that there's a lot of interest now across the world. Yeah. yeah it's it. actually one of the most unique programs for this. I n I've never seen this concept before in my life. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, surprising. It's, it's like, I, th I don't know why Europe didn't do it. I don't know why a lot of places. It's such a cool idea. Like, for yeah. example, all, always in the Arab media, we get X Factor, we get Arab Idol, we get these kind of concepts from outside. Music, but yeah. The yeah. concept of Victorious, it's made it's here. Actually, it's made, made here. Yes. So this is what's cool. It's about between uh, Abu Bakr Al Hussaini and uh, Jihad Montasar. Jihad Montasar is the first Arab player to play in Arsenal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, that's so these two guys are the brains behind it. But yeah. what is your involvement in it? I'm you the uh, advisor. You're the advisor. An advisor capacity and the footballer side. Okay. So some footballers, we will bring them and secure them for the show. Okay, as a I special judge. Last year you got uh, Ronaldinho yeah. as a as a like as a surprise for the players, and yes. he oh, was actually really dressed cool. in a security yeah. security guard. Okay, and then he yeah. surprised nice everyone. Nice prank, yeah. So yeah. Ronaldinho, he's one of the like, the, the guns of football. Yeah, the, the lineup. Yeah, no, I know who Ronaldinho is. Yeah, yeah. I know that. <laughs> the lineup is quite good. Yeah. For a show, I think so. Any guy who loves football is mm -hmm. will love this show yeah. for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, what's what's your future plans of, like you said about the project you're yes, getting? Yes, so in. project or startup number three, uh, inshallah, will be in 2017. This will be street fashion. I finished the branding. I registered the trademark. Now it's about uh, website and production, and so yeah, some work to do there. And yeah. then I'm already working on startup number four, but All that's right. still. Uh, that's and a process. Is yeah. that a secret or can, can we get a hint about, about it? it? Yes. Maybe FNB. It's two uh, between two. It's either mm. FNB for this year, mm. we have a concept there, or completely different. Mm -hmm. So, on this see. on the street fashion business, like first of all, just how it because we know that you won the best dressed, and but how would you describe street fashion? What is your description um, of that particular style? Okay, my my own words, uh, I would say it's something that is. Stylish yet comfortable, mm -hmm. uh, subtle and edgy, but you can wear it at the supermarket, and even if you go to a not a decent restaurant, you still don't look out of place. Okay. So uh, I think that's generally what I see streetwear as. It's not about wearing your XXX small T-shirt and showing <laughs> off your muscles. No, you wear something that's stylish and cool. Okay. Yeah, I never get that. I never get a guy who goes to the gym 
and then wears his baby brother's t-shirt. I don't understand that. I mean, <laughs> if you have a good figure, you don't need to wear something that tight. Just right, be comfortable. Right, right, right. For, for A-B questions, uh -huh. who inspired you for the Valentine's <laughs> Day post? Valentine's <laughs> Day inspired who, me. Like, I mean, like you, you talked about it's a uh, marketing plan. I don't think so, yeah. So, like, what, what happened you saw in... in A-B questions, if you follow it, it's... Uh, I now I'm, I'm starting to be more scheduled and organized about it, so I do it twice a week. And it talks about social issues or yeah. social things that I personally can relate to or have an opinion on. And then I want to know the opinion of the people. And the last one was Valentine's Day, because yeah. we were close to Valentine's Day. And, of course, I see my friends who have girlfriends or somebody has a wife and he's stressed and pressured and then the girl is depressed because she doesn't have a boyfriend. I'm <laughs> like, true. why so of all, all, funny this, was all this pressure? Like everyone in Valentine's Day is depressed. Yeah, right. if you are yeah nobody's married. happy. Yeah. The guy who has somebody <laughs> yeah. hates that he has to buy a gift and he's afraid it won't be good enough It'll or be what good not. Enough. It puts stress on everyone. And then yeah. it's, it's like a, home, a homework, unfortunately. Yeah, right. A gift is not supposed to be an assignment. Right. And then you see the guys who are single and they're also like crying about they know. want love and I'm like listen guys make <laughs> yeah. up your mind and then yeah and for me it's uh, that's not the point it's not about being stingy or not buying gifts I love buying gifts but I'd la rather get a gift that nobody expects right. on a random day that's how I feel that too. Yeah, that's that's uh, rather than okay it's a marketing ploy and let's raise the economy on this day and another <laughs> 10 days of the year yes exactly yeah I'd rather I always love uh, spontaneous uh, gifts I think they're way more genuine, and you shouldn't be forced to remember somebody you love. Mm -hmm. Why do you need a reminder? Mm -hmm. You don't. No, I agree with that as well. But the problem is, your girlfriend or your wife does not. <laughs> you know, I've never, <laughs> ever in my life, and this is solid, I've never celebrated Valentine's, ever. Really? College, high school, never. <laughs> I've made the sure. point. But of course, that doesn't mean you don't celebrate other days with your right. with a loved one. You right, should, right, right. of course. It's a hard sell, though, to pitch that. Yeah, to not easy. Right. Especially yeah. if all our friends look at her like, mm, yeah. poor you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> trying to, trying to explain anything. why she doesn't have any yeah. flowers. It doesn't always work. Yeah. Most from the social media influencers all over UAE. Like, we have a quite good number of people now. Yeah, we, we have think a pool. He, he's, he's doing very well. It depends which category. I mean, you have comedy, pranks, you have uh, serious people, you know. You have celebrities, you have mm -hmm. athletes. It's very different. So do you think that social media can bring these guys to do or reach their goal in being like uh, like you as an entrepreneur? Or because I, I saw Ben Bazi started as a comedian, now he's having his own company. He's the company uh, trend is definitely getting happening. Every influencer is trying to open their own PR agency or their own something. A lot of them opened and closed. And this is what I try to, to lecture mm. a lot about is uh, unfortunately, in Dubai, you have a big uh, model of copy-pasting. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just always there. You open a laundry and it does well, you find 10 next to you. <laughs> you open a shawarma place or a cupcake or a abaya, or it's just a trend. Because unfortunately, that shows you that the ones that are copying are thinking of money. They're not mm -hmm. thinking, I like this, I want to do it. Mm -hmm. And that is always my argument with people. I'm like, do not run after money. It will come. It will really come. Sometimes it takes longer, but if it's something you're really good at and you love, the quality will show. Because that's uh, a cool, par that's a cool person. He's like he he started with his work first, then he started in social media, and that's what. That's I try to have my own. I I want to be true to myself. For me, it's not about uh, reaching oh s hundreds of thousands of followers. No, uh, Alhamdulillah. If you look at the comments that I get on questions, people are thinking. Mm. I don't get these spam and rude. R rarely, you find people writing paragraphs, which I, I love. That we'll that see. means people are, are reading, are listening. So my audience are... Your audience is intentionally more of a thoughtful sort of yeah. social media. Yeah, and that's what I want. I want quality. Yeah, you know? I agree. And you're not... So in other words, because there's ways to get followers by being controversial. Or buying. Example, or buying. So many them. here, they're buying followers all over the place. Yeah. But now they're being found because there's so many softwares that show if you have a fake account or whatnot. Before, mm -hmm. people were like crazy. Oh, I want the guy who has a million followers. Yeah. But they don't even want to know if it's real or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now they're like, okay. Sometimes you can go with somebody who has 10,000 followers. But it's really about exactly. the, the, it's your market. Val the value of, yeah. the, of the followers, for sure. What would you say, well, on the so let's stay with social media for a second. Do you have a preferred flat platform? I see that you have 
a hundred and or sorry, you have sixty eight or sixty eight thousand followers on Instagram. So obviously that is a enormous amount. Would you have a preferred social media platform? Instagram. Is, yeah. Yeah. I like Instagram most. I just started on Facebook because the amount of um, adding on my personal account was getting too much and I thought, you know, why not? Uh, so I just started a page two weeks ago. Okay, it's just doing recently, good. huh? Yeah, it's doing quite good. Um, and I have Twitter. I, I have most of social, social media channels. I have Snapchat. Twitter is declining. I think Twitter has been filtered. So now people who are Twitter people are there. People who want to read bulletins, news, uh, catastrophes, quotes. You know, I'll be honest with there. you, today in my class, <coughs> my uh, web design class, I was asking the students, who uses Twitter? Not one student uses Twitter. Like, not surprised. These kids at this level, the undergrads, I don't know, do you use Twitter? I used to. You do? You no, not anymore? Okay. Used. Yeah, I'm finding that it's kind of cooled off. It's not really... It's not really definitely cool with filtered the, with the college kids. But you see, you see, I'll tell you how it is also. I remember when social media was really starting to pick up in the region, we had a photography website. And this is a big, big reason why I got into photography also. It was called Flickr. Yeah. yeah. And Flickr was really big here because yeah. there was nothing else. Yeah. So everybody suddenly became a photographer, mm -hmm. which was cool because you're pushing people to do something kind of meaningful or artistic rather than chatting or playing video games or whatnot. Photography for me is an art form. So that became huge. And then uh, they blocked it in the UAE, so that killed Flickr, but then mm. other platforms started to come. Then Twitter at one point became so popular. Mm. Yeah. Everybody was on Twitter. And everybody, what was nice about Twitter is you need to limit your words. Yeah. You have 140 characters, and it made people think and write properly, and punctuation sure. was on point. Sure. But then uh, <laughs> Instagram came, and Instagram is much easier to express. Yeah. Put a picture. You know, it doesn't have to be a professional picture. It can be a selfie, it can be whatever. Right. So that took everything, took all the attention. Sure. And then Snapchat came and kind of affected now Instagram, but Instagram is fighting and... So what's the future, you think, with the social media? I don't know. <laughs> if I knew, I would be a billionaire <laughs> by You're now. Right, exactly. <laughs> Do you use Snapchat? Yeah. Are you active on it? Or? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm active on I like social media. Yeah. I'm good at it also and I enjoy it. And I try to respect each platform. Mm -hmm and what it's made for. What makes a person good at social media? How would you define If you're interested being first. Good? I think number one, you have to be interested because a lot of people are on it out of peer pressure or because their friends are there. If you're not interested, then don't bother. Mm. If you're really interested, then yeah, you probably get good at it. And then how picky are you? Are mm. you a person with good taste? You know how to choose a nice picture or a nice video or a nice topic? Mm. Uh, it all helps. I think. So you think that the beauty of the content is the one who's affecting the social media for anyone? No, that's not only it. It can be one factor. I mean, if you're, uh, if you're talking about a good-looking model, but all of his pictures are dark and grainy, he's not going to get the quality or the right. following he wants. You know? so it, but if you have somebody who speaks well, but most of his videos are not even, it doesn't sound great, or the lighting is poor, the technology the has to support has to work, yeah, work hand the in content, hand. Right. Comedy, you look at all these comedians because they're the, some of the most popular ones, or foodies. If the pictures of the food are poor, oh, absolutely. Yeah, you true. won't go, you won't follow. A comedian who doesn't write a good script, you know. So for, for your videos, you do it alone or you alone. have? Yeah. You, you yeah, alone, yeah. So far alone. Team. If I do switch to YouTube, which I'm considering, I'll do it properly. But I think so far it's decent. You know, iPhones, surprisingly, yeah. now phones can do so much. You know, and uh, yeah, I just use a tripod and I do the video. I like chilled out. So sometimes we also just uh, will go, for example, to my mother's house, and we'll just chill in the garden. Mm. We'll sit down, have dinner there, tea, and good conversation. Um, yeah, I like to chill as much as I can. To what about sports and physical fo stuff? Football. Yeah, I hate the gym. Yeah. I really don't like the gym. I gym just to maintain shape and fitness, mm. just like homework. And I'm mm. now, I because I know I would never sustain in a gym, mm. I made a small area in my house that is a gym now, <laughs> where I know I'll do my push-ups, my sit my basics. Yeah, okay, so that's good. Just yeah. to make it convenient to, yeah. Yeah, I don't know that many people that so actually like the gym. Yeah, I don't <laughs> like them. Yeah, Some people are crazy, like about CrossFit and yeah. all of that. Yeah. Like, it was like, <laughs> these guys <laughs> shouting at each other, their friends, and they're like 
trying to encourage him, like, guys, calm down, you know. <laughs> I will do my push-ups. <laughs> you don't need to shout. But at least if you can if you can play games like that and stuff like that to keep yourself motivated. What football, I find, man. The, the, yeah, yeah, football, football, sports, even if it's CrossFit or anything that keeps you engaged. Because what happens with the gym, I think, is it gets too re repetitious. And that's yeah, what it can get boring. Yeah. yeah. Um, football, but the problem with football is it's high maintenance. I mean, I was just uh, away on a, a trip just now. I played football there and I tore my groin out mm. of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, you know, Maybe it's, it's not just stretching enough. Didn't stretch and yeah. and and, you're, and it affects everything. Yeah. So then you can't walk, you can't work properly. Yeah. And that's why, unfortunately, football or soccer is a very high maintenance sport. You need yeah. to be really fit. Yeah. You had a conversation that's about the injuries you had. Like I've had all. Have all Anything you ask, I had it probably. <laughs> and that's often from football. Football, football. Yeah, three three surgeries already, and over fifty tears for sure. Wow! So you must have played a lot of football. Then. Yeah, really. But I played at a high level. I played in the U.S., mm -hmm. Massachusetts, and then in Abu Dhabi. But you did you play for Northeastern for the yeah varsity. Oh, wow, yeah. cool. And then we played in a semi-pro team in Worcester, and then I was selected for the under-21 Massachusetts All-Star team. Hmm. And then that's where I really, I think I learned or grew up as a footballer there. Yeah, and you, that's in ironic world. because U.S. has an Imagine. issue. We have an issue. I, I played soccer as a kid, too. I keep calling it soccer. but I, It's fine. I, um, <laughs> I played soccer as a kid, and I've always enjoyed soccer, but it's never caught on, and you probably know that yeah. as well as anyone. It's never really caught on as a mainstream sport yeah. in the United States. But you guys have great sports altogether, so yeah. and traditions. Yeah. And, and I think the league in the U.S. is actually better than the league we have here, no yeah. doubt. It's yeah. more full. People are there, people are attending and enjoying. And I love the quote by Steve Jobs. He goes, um, you have to have a lot of passion for what you do because if you don't, any rational person would quit or give up. Absolutely. And I, I really believe in that because I've been through a lot of no's hearing no and no and no but you know you're stubborn because you love it uh, if you don't love it by the second time you're like you know what it's not meant to be i'm not even gonna bother right so you really have to have a lot of passion but it's not enough you need then i always i like to, to categorize them in p's so you have the passion you have the planning you have the perseverance the planning is is, is the annoying part but it's important to you you know you do a basic business plan you do a feasibility study and and now it is it's so easy. You just go on YouTube and you have all these tutorials just to, and it's not that difficult. Some research, some prices and quotations and you, you know how to build a business plan. So I'm always surprised when people are like, okay, what should I do, what should I do? Google, literally. And you'll find all the answers. You don't need to even go to a, an organization to teach you. And the perseverance is, comes, it's very connected to the first P. If you're not passionate, you don't fight. You give up. And usually, if you fight at least one or two more times, you probably make it. You need that one more time. Mm -hmm. Our Ahdaf, we were rejected three times with the most important approval. The fourth time we went, we got it. I always think, what if I stopped mm. and try number two? Because a lot of people, of course, start to pop up and like, you see, we told you it's not meant mm -hmm. to be, it's not going to happen. I see, I you. And you shouldn't bother yourself. Right. And, and, you know. People around also affect yeah, something. Yeah, even friends and family. You notice a lot of people, they will go against you. Or they'll think, you know, why are you bothering yourself? Or, but then you have to, that's where you need passion. If you don't have it, you don't try.